Well, we're continuing our study of Second Chronicles, and we're going to cover chapters 33 to the end tonight. And uh, last time we talked about one of the best kings of the southern kingdom, Hezekiah. But he's followed by Manasseh and then Josiah. So it's going to be a study of contrasts to put us in a broad perspective. First and Second Chronicles, First Chronicles had the genealogies from 1 to 9 and then the reign of David. Second Chronicles focuses on Solomon, the first nine chapters, and then the Davidic dynasty that we've been going through. We're going to go right up to the end uh, until the captivity of Babylon tonight and the Davidic dynasty. Very important because this is the dynasty that's going to rule the world. Our king, the king that we have allegiance to, is the final climactic king of that dynasty. But the monarchy, of course, under Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, split under the civil war into the southern kingdom we call Judah and the northern kingdom it called itself Israel, which by the time we get to tonight's study has gone into, uh, been, it's been wiped out. The, the Assyrians have uh, captured them, distributed them, and eliminated them as a political entity. Judah is going to end up with a similar destiny, but with a very distinctive difference that they will go into captivity with a commitment by God that they, it'll only last 70 years and they will return. And that make difference is only because of God's commitment to David, not because they deserve it. Now, First and Second Samuel takes us up to Solomon. First Kings and Second Kings parallels what uh, the Chronicles deal with, pretty much. Um, First, First Chronicles really is parallel with Second Samuel, but Second Chronicles covers from the same uh, duration that First Kings and Second Kings does. First and Second Kings being the political record, Chronicles being the priestly or Levitical uh, record. Or putting it another way, Chronicles focuses on the southern kingdom from God's perspective. And he ha he's, he's an editor with a different agenda, if you will. And we're much closer to the end now than we were before. Now, we subsequently, previously, a couple of times ago, looked at uh, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. And uh, there we go. And I wanted to mention something to remind you when we first went through the genealogies. Remember that Matthew did not make reference to three people in his genealogy. Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. Each one of these were slain. And uh, Deuteronomy 29 verse 20 says, The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smote against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. These are the, this was the the threat that God described in Deuteronomy, and uh, that's exactly what happened with these three kings, and if you look, examine Matthew's genealogy, you'll discover they are indeed blotted out for what it's worth. It shall blot out his name. In any case, last time we talked, we worked our way up to Hezekiah. He's one of the five good guys, um, and so uh, one of the best kings of the gang here. The northern kingdom went from bad to worse. The southern kingdom went had a lot, mostly bad, but there were a few good ones, five good ones out of the bunch. And, uh, but today, uh, and he Hezekiah, something that is not really emphasized in Chronicles, but is in First and Second Kings, is that God gave him a 15-year extension in his life. And that's a subject of a lot of debate among scholars, because during that 15-year extension, two major things occurred. One is... Um, that's where these ambassadors came from Babylon, and Hezekiah made the big mistake of, of giving them hospitality and showing them all his treasures, which, of course, just simply set the stage for Babylon, gave them their ambition, which a generation later came and, and uh, helped themselves. But the other thing that happened during that extension is Manasseh was born, and uh, he was bad news. And so... Some people try to philosophize a little bit that maybe it would have been better off he hadn't gotten his extension. But in any case, we're going to go from Hezekiah, the good king, in chapter 29 through 32, to Manasseh in chapter 33. That's our first segment tonight. And uh, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. So he, uh, he reigned a long, long time. And... Uh, Clearly, the young guy didn't learn much from his father. His father's one of the best kings, but when he takes over, it's bad news, really bad news. He set about to do, to, to do all the evil, th all the things you could think of to anger God. 
And as verse 2 says, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord did cast out before the children of Israel. You know, it's interesting. You'd think they would have learned by example. Their brothers to the north had embraced idolatry, and they got clobbered. God did exactly what the prophet said they were going to do, and he wiped them out. You'd think that the southern kingdom would have learned something by that, but nevertheless, that's what they did. They rebuilt the high places that they're called, the altars to the heathen idols, and uh, the fertility, uh, a fertility goddess, and so forth. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah's father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, Balaam being plural of Baal, of course, and made groves, the groves there being essentially phallic symbols, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them, host of heaven being the planets and so forth, and, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall be my name forever. So God, this is especially offensive. Idol worship is always offensive to God, but doing it in the place that he has set aside for himself is especially offensive. And uh, he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He not only did this, but he did it in the house of the Lord. That, that in a sense, is even more insulting. And uh, so, and like his grandfather, Ahaz, he also offers his own son as uh, sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. And uh, so verse uh, 6 there, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times. In other words, he, that's like astrology. And he used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. And he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now, always this, they call it the New Age. There's nothing New Age about the New Age at all. It's paganism with just new packaging. What they called, uh, you know, familiar spirits, we call channelers. But same, same business. And uh, so he, he indulged in sorcery, which is basically to define it. What is sorcery? Seeking to gain power from evil spirits. And uh, divination. Seeking to interpret the future by omens. And uh, witchcraft. Seeking to control others through the communication with evil spirits. So these things are obviously all related, and yet they have their distinctives. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. And uh, so, most serious thing of all, he, put, he set up an image of an Asherah, if you will, uh, within the temple which was supposed to be used exclusively by the Lord. So this is very insulting, and of course even Second Kings deals with that in some depth. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed um, for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and, the st and of the statutes and of the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So that was God's commitment. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err. And to do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. God destroyed the northern tribes for their idolatry. And yet, uh, they did even worse, because they did that idolatry right in uh, the dedicated spaces. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. So Manasseh is a bad king, and he also led the people astray. And uh, God tried to, you know, Correct it, but they wouldn't listen. So wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. So because Manasseh and his people ignored the Lord, his punishment was swift and sure. Assyria, again, the same people that took the northern kingdom into slavery are still a power there, and they came against uh, Judah. And uh, with great ruthlessness, they bound Manasseh put a hook in his nose, and, uh, as if he was a wild bull or something, and uh, took him off to Babylon, which is a, was a, a Syrian southern. In these days, Babylon was a, just a troublesome city-state of Syria. They're, in the coming few years, Babylon is going to get its freedom. But at this stage, Babylon is just a, a, a political uh, football of Assyria, in effect. And when he was in affliction, this is Manasseh now, and this is a very interesting thing. You, you, we could spend a lot of time talking about how evil Manasseh was. In fact, the first Kings, excuse me, second Kings rendering of all of this, there was blood from border to border. And God's uh, 
judgment on Manasseh is very, very severe. But here, the Chronicles just focuses right in on something, another dimension of this that we, we're going to take heart in. When he, Manasseh, was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. This evil king, the most evil of the bunch, repented. And God honored that. And that should remind you of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Remember that verse we talked about in such depth back some sessions ago? That says, if my people are called by name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's God's commitment. And that's exactly what Manasseh did. He besought the Lord as God, humbled himself before the God of his fathers. He prayed unto him and was entreated of him, and he heard as if God heard him and brought him again to Jerusalem, his kingdom, and he knew that the Lord was God. So why is this so important? Because this means that we all have hope. No matter how bad you are, remember Manasseh. By repenting and turning from that, God forgave him. God healed him. And that's astonishing when you really understand his career. He was the worst of the bunch. And uh, Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon, in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, encompassed about Ophel, and raised up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. So he rebuilt the defenses, probably in anticipation of another Assyrian onslaught. But in any case, he's... And he took away the strange gods, and the idol out of the house of the Lord, and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord, and in Jerusalem, he cast them out of the city. Praise God. That's how God's measuring things. How's he measuring you? Do we have idols that should be cast out of our house, out of our life? Are we carrying baggage of some kind? And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So he restored proper worship here. He removed all the pagan idols uh, for which he'd been responsible. But he... he, he uh, did restitution, so to speak. But nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. Now, the rest of the acts of Manasseh, and by the way, they, see, the people were used to worshiping in the high places. That was the wrong place, but they're used to it, so they continued there, even though they're worshiping the Lord. So, um, now, now, the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spoke unto them in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And the word Israel here speaks for the total nation, thus it really is talking about Judah, because the northern kingdom that called itself Israel is now gone. It's, it's, uh, the, only, the southern kingdom is the only thing left. I mention that, though, because some people make a big thing of nomenclature. You need to realize that term is used connotatively, uh, generically for the whole nation there. His prayer also, and how God was entreated of him, and all his sin, and his trespass, and the places wherein he built his high places, and set up groves and graven images, before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the say, sayings of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. In other words, not in the king's, but in his own palace, and not in the place of honor. And Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, one of the provocative, um, now, because of his, his wickedness uh, as a history, they didn't, uh, he wasn't buried in the tombs of the kings, in his own palace. It's strange that we can have a king like Hezekiah, who is so outstanding, and his son Manasseh was bad news. That must give us pause. Because how often do we know a really good family, good Christian family, raising kids the way they should, and everything seems to be right, and yet those kids can turn and be rebellious. It's a very, very... Not always, fortunately, and often when they do, they still can, they come back. Like, but still, it's a there's no simple answer. It's a subject of a lot of discussion, but uh, it's it's a sobering thing to recognize the intrinsic rebellion that can be even in a well brought up environment, and so forth. And Ammon is his son. Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He had a pretty short. Uh, time. He was a bad news, and unlike his father, he did not repent. 
in verse two, uh, 22, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh's father, for Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh's father had made, and served them, and humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh's father had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more, and his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. His own servants assassinated him. So it was, uh, his moves were very unpopular. But the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against the king Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. Now Josiah is a good guy, young, but a very good guy. He takes, he takes, uh, he takes uh, charge. Second Chronicles chapter 34, Josiah. Now there's going to be some things occurring in Josiah's life that will lead to some unsolved riddles that will be the subject of our final session after this one. But so we're going from Manasseh to Josiah in two chapters. So oh, he's a good guy. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David, his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, whatever, and declined neither to the right nor to hand to the left. In other words, he was a straight guy. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father, and in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images, the molten images. So he, uh, he uh, the, uh, see, when uh, Manasseh had later purged the land of the, the bad things, it was just in uh, the uh, temple area and so forth. The land itself needed attention, and that's what he, so he, so uh, Josiah is purging uh, Judah and Jerusalem uh, from the high places, groves, and so forth. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on the high above them. He cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. In other words, he uh, took all their paraphernalia, crushed it, wrecked it, burned it, whatever, and uh, burned the bones of the pagan priests on their very altars. So this guy... He was serious about it, didn't mess around. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So did he in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even in Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. Now, I want you to notice Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and uh, Naphtali. Are these part of the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom? Northern kingdom. And uh, obviously, we were talking geographically, not tribally. That's where everybody gets messed up. The, 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 this whole idea of the ten lost tribes is a myth, and I want you to be sensitive as you go through the Scripture that again and again that demonstrates that is a myth and uh, leads to a lot of confusion. But in any case, uh, Josiah here is cleaning house throughout the whole land, including up north, Manasseh and Ephraim, Naphtali, that's all up north. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. And uh, now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So the temple's a mess. These guys are dispatched to clean house, fix that up, repair it. And when they came to Hel Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and of all the remnant of Israel and of all of Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. I want you to notice that all these tribes, Manasseh, Ephraim, and so forth, the so-called lost tribes, they certainly weren't lost in that day, uh, they were actually sending money for the repair of the temple. And incidental to our thing, but I want you to be sensitive to that as we go. And they put it in the hand of the workman that had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workman that brought the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house, even to the artificers, the builders that gave they it, to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings, and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. Okay, the men did the work faithfully, and the overseas of them were uh, Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites and the sons of Merari and Zechariah and Meshullam, of the sons of the Kohathites, to set it, for, uh, set it forward, and the other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. Also, they were over the bearers of burdens, 
and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service, and of the Levites, there were scribes and officers and porters. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. This is a very interesting statement. It's pivotal. It changes the history of Israel. See, when they, they, when they went in the house, they're doing repairs, they're remodeling, and the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Scholars suspect that this may be referring to the, an original copy by Moses himself. And it apparently was so venerated that it was put in a special chest and hidden because all the copies of the Torah had been destroyed by Manasseh. He was trying to wipe out Judaism. And so he, wiped, he, he took all the Torah things to, and had them destroyed. They thought they were all gone under Manasseh and under Ammon. But as they're repairing the temple, they find a chest hidden some way, and in it they find the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. This implies an original copy. It certainly was a very specially venerated copy. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord, and they have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes. He was so moved, he was so shocked to realize by reading the word of God that how far they'd fallen. And the, 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 the young king was obviously deeply distressed. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Hikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the servant of the kings, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. This dramatizes the king how far they'd fallen, and he's concerned not just for himself, but the, all the people, the whole people, all that are left in Israel and Judah. And uh, so, so Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess. Now that's, most commentators just pass over this. Okay, they went to the prophetess to find out what the prophetess had word from the Lord. This raises some questions if you're a diligent student. Why does the high priest on behalf of the king have to go to a prophetess that tells you the Ark of the Covenant's not around. The, 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 it's not, the, 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 the Levitical system is not in place somehow. That's usually where, that's where you know, Moses went to the, ask the Lord himself. When the tabernacle's there, the Holy of Holies, the Ark Covenant, the high priest would communicate, be, communicate, communicate directly. That's obviously not operating here. That's going to be important to us later as we reflect on some of this, but let's go on. Anyway, hold of the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Turkveth, the, uh, the son of Hazra, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spoke to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Wow, okay. Tell ye the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place. He had previously pronounced that. In the days of, because of Manasseh, because there was blood from border to border, God pronounced a judgment that was coming. And here she's confirming that. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard, Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, 
when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and humblest thyself before me and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. And so they brought the king word again. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. But God is saying, the judgment is coming because they deserve it. But because this king, this young king, Josiah, has had his heart in the right place, it won't come in his lifetime. He's going to have years of peace. It's after he dies that God will bring the judgment. That's what he's saying. Then the king sent and gathered, unto all, gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the men, great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. Praise God for that. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and the statutes with all his heart, with all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. Now this could be Exodus 20, as some people feel it is, Exodus 20 through 23. Some of feel it was, he was reading all of Deuteronomy. They generally assume he didn't read the whole Torah, but uh, he certainly read the relevant parts here that, that are here alluded to. And he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did, according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. That is a great report card. That kid did pretty well. But now we get into chapter 35. It's the next to the last chapter of the book of Second Chronicles. And it'll read straight forward. It'll tell you a story. But I want you to be careful with the details because it's my suspicion that it hints at some major, major mysteries that we're going to explore in the subsequent session. Second Chronicles 35, verse 1, More, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, which is a, obviously the, the, the traditional day. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord. And he said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. This little verse, verse 3, is overlooked, in my mind, by virtually every commentator I've looked at. What, what um, the king is telling the Levites to do is to bring the ark into the house, the temple, which Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, did build. That means the ark was not in the temple. Okay. It shall not be a burden up on your shoulders. That means it's in transit somewhere. And it's a, a matter of speculation as to where it might be, but I'll come to that. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. They apparently are not serving the people Israel. So the Levites have the ark somewhere outside the country. Now, this is the command the king, gave the king gives the Levites. And virtually every commentary I've looked at presumes that's what the Levites did. It doesn't say they did. And I'm beginning personally to suspect that this leads to a whole other thing that we'll get into subsequently, but I just want to let you do it while we're here. Put the, holy ark, put, uh, put the holy ark in the house, which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, had built. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. Okay. It doesn't say they complied. They apparently had taken the ark and the mercy seat. You know, that's something else. We tend to presume that the mercy seat and the ark are the same thing. No, they're two elements. The mercy seat happens to be on top of the ark, and obviously they're often spoken of together for that reason. They obviously, what they probably did is during these horrible days 
of Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, who ruled for 55 years and tried to wipe out all forms of what we would call Mosaic Judaism. So to protect the Ark of the Covenant from his ravages, he apparently went through the temple, destroyed it, burned the Torah. The Levites took the Ark of the Covenant out of there, out of his jurisdiction, out of the temple, out of the Jerusalem, out of the country. I'm going to show you why we suspect they fled under the protection of Pharaoh Necho in Egypt. But let's move on here. Verse 4. He continued to instruct the Levites, Prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers after your courses, according to the writing of the king, uh, David the king of Israel, and according to the writing of Solomon the son. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people, and after the division of the families of the Levites. So kill the Passover, sanctify yourselves, prepare your brethren, that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And Josiah gave to the people of the flock, the lambs and kids, all for the Passover offerings for all that were present, to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks. These were of the king's substance. So... These are, in effect, out of his pocket, in a sense. And his princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests, and to the Levites. Nakiah and Zechariah and Jehiel, the rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. So they gave generously. Coniah also, and Shemaiah, and Nethaniel, his brethren, and Hashabiah, and Jehiel, and Jezebed, chief of the Levites, gave unto the Levites for Passover offerings 5,000 small cattle and 500 oxen. So the service was prepared and the priests stood in their place and the Levites in their courses according to the king's commandment. And they killed the Passover and the priests sprinkled the blood from their hands and the Levites flayed them and they removed the burnt offerings that they might give according to the divisions of the families of the people to offer unto the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses and uh, so did they with the oxen. And they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance, but the other holy offerings saw they in pots and in cauldrons and in pans and divided them speedily among all the people. And afterward, they made ready for themselves and for the priests because the priests of the sons of Aaron were busied in the, burning, uh, the offering of burnt offerings and uh, the fat until night. Therefore, the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, uh, the sons of Aaron. And the singers of the sons of Asaph were in their place according to the commandment of David and Asaph and Heman and Jedithan, the king's seer, and the porters waited at every gate that they might not depart from their service for their brethren, the Levites, prepared for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings upon the altar of the Lord according to the commandment of the king Josiah and the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time and the feast of unleavened bread seven days. So Passover technically is that one day, following day's feast of unleavened bread that goes on for seven days, and those seven days include, depending on the calendar, the Sunday in there, the morning after Shabbat, after Passover, is the Feast of First Fruits. So those are all generally, those three feasts, the three spring feasts of Israel are lumped together, often called Passover connotatively. But in any case, there it is. And so there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel for the days of Samuel the prophet. That's quite a statement. There was no Passover like, there was no Passover like to that kept in, the day, in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. Big deal. Okay. And after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates and Josiah went out against him. Now let's back up a second here. Sudden change of subject here. We finish with the Passover thing. In about 609 B.C., Assyria, the, the empire that had ruled for so many centuries, became weak and lost a lot of her empire, especially a city to the south called Babylon. In a few years, that city, will, under uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a son that was a very sharp general, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he becomes very, very effective. And he's able to not only free Babylon from Assyria, but in effect to become the dominant empire in a matter of a few years. So that's all starting here. So Assyria is showing some weakness. It's fragmentation. Okay. Nineveh itself uh, fell in, in uh, about 
three years earlier. Uh, so Assyria is in trouble in a sense. The capital of Nineveh had fallen and about 612. And so they concentrated their, their forces around Haran and Karshemish in the upper Euphrates. Now, this attack by Pharaoh Necho against Assyria is understandable. He's, he's getting strong in power. Assyria's starting to crumble. He's going there to strengthen himself. That makes sense. But why is Josiah going out against Pharaoh Necho? Assyria is the traditional enemy of Israel. You would think that the enemy of your enemy is your friend. You would think that if he's going to do anything, he would be helping, helping Pharaoh Necho go against the Assyria. That's what he's doing. He, um, he's going against Pharaoh Necho. And this puzzles Pharaoh Necho, as you'll see in a minute. One of the questions you have to ask yourself, why is Josiah going against Pharaoh Necho? There's a very obvious answer that everybody misses. But in any case, at this point, it's an enigma. So verse 21. So Necho says, for, he sent ambassadors to him. That's Pharaoh Necho sending ambassadors to Josiah. To Josiah. He sent ambassadors to him saying, what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. Get this now. For God commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Wow. Pharaoh Necho is telling Josiah, what are you doing? I'm doing what God told me to do. That's Pharaoh Necho's claim. You might say, well, that may be just an empty boast of his. No, the next verse is going to underscore something. Notice what the Pharaoh Necho is saying. He said, for God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. That's what Necho is telling Josiah. You got the picture? The more you study it, it's really strange. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him. And hearken not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God. Those are words of the chronicler. That's not a quote of Necho here. This is a, a comment by the chronicler. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him. And he hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. How on earth would Pharaoh Necho hear instructions from the mouth of God? Any guesses? From the Ark of the Covenant. Right on. We'll get to that. The archer shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. Okay. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot, put him in a second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. And he was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers, and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. So Josiah's death is a tragic, tragic national, uh, it's a national tragedy. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah, and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day, and made them an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. By the way, it's not, that's probably not the book of Lamentations by Jeremiah, but an equivalent uh, uh, product on this area. Now the acts of Josiah and his goodness, according to that which was written in the law of the Lord, his deeds, first and last, behold, they are all written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Okay. I'm going to leave that for now. We're going to go to the final chapter of what happens after Josiah dies as far as the, uh, the southern kingdom is concerned. And that will finish Chronicles, but I've, I've saved a session to go back and unravel this mystery that I think will uh, fascinate you as we get into it. So let's just table Josiah and Necho for the moment and finish the, the Chronicle uh, uh, rendering here. So we're in chapter 36, the final days. We're going to go from Josiah and take a quick look at four kings, the final four rascals that, get, that bring the dynasty uh, in a sense, to, it, 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 it takes it right up to the Babylonian captivity. Chapter 36, verse 1, Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Josiah had at least four sons, who, and, and three of which became kings of Judah. And the first of these was not the oldest, incidentally, but was Jehoahaz, and he's a, he was an appointee by the people, really, after Josiah's death. 
and he remained in power for only three months for reasons that aren't given. And uh, Necho dethroned him. He's strong enough that Necho's calling the shots here, and Pharaoh Necho dethroned him, levied on Judah a tax of 100 talents of silver and a talent of, of gold, as you'll see here. Jehoiaz was 20 and three years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. The king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem, condemned the land in 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. So that's uh, 33 tons of silver and about uh, you know, 75 pounds of, of gold. That's a lot of gold, even, you know, especially today. But in any case, uh, the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and turned his name into Jehoiakim. So he, the king renames him, if you will. Shows you the power he had over all this. And Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. And Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and bound him with feathers to carry him to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar also carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Actually, at a museum right across the, the uh, processional way. This is the, uh, the uh, deportation that probably took Daniel to Babylon. Um, and Daniel and his three friends were taken captive. Um, so the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar to be his instrument here of, of judgment, if you will. And uh, so the, uh, there's obviously a lot more drama here than we need to get into detail here. But this is the first siege. He'd dri Nebuchadnezzar had driven Egyptians out of Palestine by about 605 B.C. And that's when Daniel and his friends were deported. Jehoiakim had at first been loyal to Nebuchadnezzar, but after three years he rebelled in about 602. That's in all 2 Kings 24. The chronicler, but not 2 Kings, reports that Jehoiakim was then bound with bronze shackles and taken to Babylon along with the sacred objects of the temple. So uh, this was the first of three sieges. The first siege starts the servitude of the nation. The third siege will be starts the desolations of Jerusalem. Both of these are 70 years long, but they're not coterminous. They're all 70 years exactly to the day, strangely. The, sea, the servitude of the nation starts with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, and it's concluded by the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus the Persian. And uh, the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar starts the desolations of Jerusalem, and it is terminated by the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, which is the trigger for Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. So if you're studying prophecy precisely, uh, that's all worth getting into. I won't try to get into it all here. I was tempted to, but it'll take a lot of time to develop all that. Uh, just tie, I just encourage you to tie that to your study of, uh, uh, your study of uh, Daniel, if you will. Now apparently Jehoiakim was released or escape from Babylon because he was given a dishonorable burial outside the gates of Jerusalem in Jeremiah 22. Now the acts, uh, me, <clears throat> now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations which he did and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead. Now Jehoiachin is also called Jeconiah. That causes a lot of confusion. Jehoiachin was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is the guy. He's called Jeconiah by Jeremiah, but it's the same guy. He's also called Jehoiachin. God is so upset by now that he says in Jeremiah 22.30, Write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. Now, if you have a Jewish friend that, is, that knows his Tanakh, his scriptures, give him Jeremiah 22, 30 and ask him, how do, you, how do you get a Messiah out of this? The Messiah has to come from the royal line, and now the royal line has a blood curse on it. Where do you go with that? Just leave that with him. Resolve. It turns out there's no way out of that box canyon except one, and that's a virgin birth. And that's the daughters of Zelophehad. So Je Je Jeconiah and Jehoiachin are the same guys, in effect. Now, we look at the genealogy in Luke. You remember, he starts with Adam. He goes down through Noah. We talked a lot about that before. 
Matthew goes from Abraham to David. And of course, Luke's genealogy connects that from Noah down to... He got with, so the last part of Luke's genealogy from Abraham to David and Matthew is obviously identical. No problem there. But when you get to David, a different thing happened. By the way, the last four, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David, you'll find encrypted in the, in the 38th chapter of Genesis in 49 letter intervals in chronological order and are also listed in the last chapter of Ruth. But moving on, the house of David, what happens here? Well, Matthew, of course, goes through the first surviving son of Bathsheba, Solomon, down through Rehoboam, and these very kings we've been talking about, until you get to Jehoiakim, we've got a problem there, because there's a curse, a blood curse on that line. And that line ends up with Joseph, who is the legal father, but not the blood father of Jesus Christ. Luke's a doctor. He's concerned about... Christ's humanity, and when he go, comes to David, he does it a left turn. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan, and he goes down through a genealogy by bloodline to Mary. And Heli is the father of Mary, but he's the father that adopts Joseph as a son because of the provisions of the daughters of Zelophehad. When you get to Salathiel and Zerubbabel, you wonder, well, how did they get in there? Because they also are in, this, they, the, they are in the bloodline See, they're, they're not carrying the bloodline of Jehoiachin. How does that come off? Well, Jeconiah and Chaltiel, the same wife, it was the duty of the, um, there's a Levite marriage involved where the duty of the brother raises up seed to the son. To, and that goes to Zerubbabel and on it goes. So uh, you can sort that out. We did that all, this is all by way of review when we got at this earlier, the Levite marriage comes from Levir, meaning husband's brother. And it's codified in the Torah in Deuteronomy 25. And Padiah raises up seed for Shaltiel, which leads to Zerubbabel as the seed of Padiah, but in the name of Shaltiel. He's not actually the bloodline of Shaltiel. And uh, Luke links Padiah to Neri, the blood descendant of David, because he's going through the wife, if you will, and her father. So, but in any case, uh, Zerubbabel's line in the Chronicler lists Zerubbabel's seven sons and one daughter. None of them appear in the genealogy, either Matthew or Luke. All of this is by way of review, if you recall when we dealt with this earlier. And so, okay. The, this all built on the daughters of Zelophehad. The Torah had an exception on the rules of inheritance. It was requested by Zelophehad. He had five daughters. He requested that of Moses in Numbers 27. Moses goes to the Lord. The Lord says, make that exception. When you get to the days of Joshua, those five daughters come to Joshua, and indeed he checks the record in Joshua 17. He grants that inheritance. What most people don't recognize is the claims of Christ hang on that exception. Because in, when, that, when you had this situation, as long as the daughter, if there are no sons, if the daughter married within the tribe, the father of the bride adopted her husband as his son. And that happens in Ezra, and Nehemiah, and a number of other places. And this anticipates the lineage of Christ because it is a way that the virgin birth lines up Christ to get of both the house and lineage of David. And so J Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. If you look at Luke 3.23, in the Greek... The word is nomitso, which means reckoned as by law. He's the son-in-law of Heli, not the son of Eli. So that's the virgin birth. It's hinted at in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. It's prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 7.14. And it's required by the blood curse on the royal lion in Jeremiah 22.30. All by way of review, but I share it with you because it can be very powerfully used. But let's move on. Second Chronicles 36. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon, the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord, and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. And Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. After the first siege, the false prophets tried to get the king to rebel. And Jeremiah in Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon said, Don't do it. Nebuchadnezzar is the hand of God. And uh, they threw Jeremiah in prison because uh, he was a traitor. And they, they, fanned, they got the king on an ego trip, and he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came and put it down, put a second king in charge. And uh, we get to Zedekiah, and when Zedekiah, same thing. At first, the, you know, the prophet said, come on, we've got to throw, we're, the, we're God's people, we've got to throw Nebuchadnezzar, the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar off. Jeremiah said, don't do it, because if you do, God will destroy Jerusalem. And uh, they eventually got him on his ego, tri uh, ego trip, and he uh, reigned 11 years, and then he also rebels, 
against Nebuchadnezzar, and you get to the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. By now, Nebuchadnezzar's had a belly full of the whole operation. He goes there, and he levels the place, and that's the third siege. Zedekiah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as God, humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from the turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion upon the young man or maiden or old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all unto his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, and all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of the God, and they break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And all them that escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his servants and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fill three scores and ten years. This is a very interesting verse, verse 21 here. Why did the southern kingdom go into captivity for exactly 70 years? To the day. To the day. And uh, this was prophesied by Jeremiah. In fact, Daniel, reading Jeremiah prophecy in Daniel chapter 1 goes to prayer and that leads to the whole 70 weeks vision of Daniel 9. But why 70 years? And the answer of course is because this is exactly what Leviticus required. You go to Leviticus 25. Here's what God said to Moses. The Lord said to Moses in the Mount of Sinai saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. There's a Sabbath for man. Six days you work, seventh you rest. There's a Sabbath for the land. Seven years you plow it, the seventh you let the land rest. That's called a sabbatical year. Six years shalt thou sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be, but, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. It's very interesting that in today, in Israel, they get around this by selling the land to an Arab, and at the end of the year, buying it back, leaving him a small profit for the dodge. That way they're not doing it. It's those guys, see? Typical, you know, loophole-seeking thing. But in any case, so that incidentally is, uh, okay, that's the, okay, so we have five kings that are the good guys, just to refresh here. We've gone through all these kings from, uh, from, from the civil war under Rehoboam on down, Abijah. Asa and Jesphat, good guys. Jehoram, Ahaziah, and Athaliah, the, the queen, uh, bad news. Joash, good guy. Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, bad news. Hezekiah, great guy, one of the best. Manasseh, the worst. And Josiah, good kid. And then these last four guys finally plunge it into captivity. Get to Second Chronicles 36, verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, now before I get to this, I might remind you, this is a place where you might want to read Daniel 5. Belshazzar in Babylon is in charge. The Persians are on the horizon. Instead of defending, he's convinced that his place is invincible, so he throws a party for a thousand of his nobles. And during that party, the shrewd general, Babylonian general, diverts the Euphrates River so the water drops and his troops slip in under the gates and take over the place. 
And uh, that's the fall of Babylon. While all this is going on in the party, the fingers of a man's hand right on the wall, you know the story. Very exciting time. Ten days after conquering Babylon, Cyrus makes his big entrance. Daniel presents him a copy of Isaiah, a letter written to him 150 years before he was born by Isaiah. And it calls him by name, describes his career, and says, because of this you will know that I am the God of these people, and you'll let them go. And he does. He does. And so this is a proclamation that Cyrus says, Thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, All the kingdom of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Okay, so that's the last thing. Now what this is here, if you go to the London Museum, this is a replica, not the original, obviously. But uh, this is a replica of the Cylinder of Cyrus. If you go to the London Museum, go take a look at this, and it'll have the translation for you. And that's, this is what this is exactly what he's saying. Because he can brag to the world he did not conquer Babylon, he, he conquered Babylon without firing a shot, so to speak. He just took it over. And why is that so important? Because the judgment that Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51 describe, the judgment on Babylon has never happened. It was conquered, but never destroyed the way the Bible talks about. And when you go through all that, you'll discover that Babylon has to reemerge on the world scene to be a major power in order to receive the judgment that God has proclaimed. That's if you take the Bible seriously. But all this is confirmed by Cyrus himself. If you go to the London Museum, I encourage you to check that out. A good friend of mine by the name of Terry Holt uh, knew I wanted a replica. He went and got one for me, so it's a special gift from him. So where do you go next? Well, you're through the book of Chronicles. So from here, you'd normally go to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which then carry the history of the return after the Babylonian captivity. That's why they believe the first St. Chronicles, Ezra and, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah were all built by the same scribal team, if you will, under the direction of Ezra. But uh, so this should be, could be a natural study next to the return of Israel back to the land under Ezra. Uh, trying to build the temple, not getting very far until Nehemiah gets the authority to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And that triggers the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, which predicts the exact day that their Messiah would ride that donkey into Jerusalem. Terrific study. But we have one session left. We've done 15 sessions. We've got a 16th session to add a little addenda to your study of, of uh, First and Second Chronicles. A provocative addenda. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. All kinds of fanciful books written, all kinds of strange stories. Where are they today? Are they around anywhere? Do they have a destiny? And is that destiny alluded to in the Word of God? That's the question, and we'll take a look at that in the next session.